So I am indeed Matthew Norton. I am a venture capitalist at Venrock, and I'm going to try to convince you over the course of the next 10 minutes that we need radical technology innovation to scale the world for 10 billion people. But I'm not going to do that by talking with you about electrons or hydrocarbons. Instead, I would like to speak with you about the brain, specifically <laughs> human evolution and neuroscience. And to do that, we need to start with the problem. I think everyone here in the room knows the problem, but let's sum it up. It really comes down to three numbers. The first one is people. It took us 200,000 years to get the first billion people, but we got the next billion in only 130, the next billion after that in only 30 years, and our most recent billion in 13. Demographers think that we've got another three billion to go before 2050, and they tend to count low. Second number is stuff per person, or GDP per head. Now, if you look back in time at this figure, you find that pretty much nothing happened since 0 AD until you got to about 1750 when it went upward in an exponential curve. The third number is resources per unit of stuff, or the resource intensity of GDP. To give you one example, in China, between 2000 and 2005, GDP per head went up 62%. That's a big number. Oil per head went up 400%. So the problem, people times stuff per person times resources per unit of stuff. Multiply that through, and you have a vertical curve of resource consumption. We need more of everything. More food, more fuel, more water, more critical materials. And there are two conventional narratives as to how exactly we're going to do that. Narrative one is that we're just going to produce more stuff. We will extract more from a finite planet. Now, I, I don't subscribe to that point of view. I think most people here don't. I'm not going to belabor it. I'm instead going to talk about the other sort of package narrative we get, which is that we'll consume less. This is the radical efficiency view of the world that holds that some combination of technologies, from high-tech stuff like energy monitors to mid-tech stuff like little tiny cars to low-tech stuff uh, like rain barrels in my backyard, will enable us to conserve our way to nirvana. Now, I don't think this works, and I don't think it works for one specific reason, and that's human nature, right? These are my daughters. Their names are Abby and Ada. Uh, they're now about 10 and 8. And when they turned 2 years old, I didn't have to grab their legs and place one foot in front of another. They just walked. I didn't have to make shapes out of their mouth. They just talked. These are things people just do. And what else do people just do? Well, we consume. We consume territory. We are the one species with a geographic range broader than the cockroach. We consume other species. Wherever people have gone, a wave of mass extinctions has followed us. And we consume resources, even when it means our downfall. Think about the Easter Islanders, or the Anasazi, or the Mayans. So you have to ask yourself, why do we consume so relentlessly? just like we walk and talk. Well, I think you have to begin with the assumption that human beings are products of natural selection, and natural selection doesn't have a windshield. It only has a rear view mirror. It can only act on crude proxies for what's led to reproductive success in the past. Some of those proxies are behaviors that get baked into DNA, like fly toward the light or build the nest. But we humans have a bit of a problem, right? We can exist in such a wide diversity of environments that there's no absolute amount of consumption that should be good for us, right? You know, we could either be sweltering or freezing. We could have a lot or a little. The only thing that would be a real trigger uh, for knowing we were doing it right would be to always have more, more than those around us and more than we had yesterday. And pretty much every line of evidence in human behavior that you can find points to this conclusion. We can start with anecdote, right? What do these five guys have in common? They're all extraordinarily wealthy, right? You know what else they have in common? They all continue to work. There's no absolute amount that's enough for them. What they're going for is more. You find this in sociology. This is a line here showing average income in the US over a 50-odd year period. Goes up every year. Absolute standards of living went up during this time period, too. Lots more cars, lots more refrigerators. This is the line of people telling you that they are very happy. 
And you can see why, right? Every year there's an upper tenth percentile, a lower tenth, there's a median. Doesn't matter how much the curve absolutely goes upward, everybody's relative position on average is the same. You find this from experimental psychology. Would you rather have 100 bucks while everybody else has 50, or would you rather have $200 while everyone else has 500, knowing that a dollar bought the same in both scenarios? With a very predictable skew, people pick the former irrationally. They don't take the absolute greatest amount of stuff, they choose more. There's evidence that this even goes to the level of your brain. There's a little structure here called the medial orbitofrontal cortex. It's a reward center. It lights up reliably when you experience things that you like. So I'm going to show you results from research done by a guy named uh, Antonio Rangel at Caltech. His subjects were the Berkeley Wine Club. And he put them into MRI scanners like this one, put a little tube in the corner of their mouth, and said, you're about to taste a succession of wines. Don't tell us anything. We're just going to read what your brain says. But to give you an idea of what's coming, before we send the next wine up through the tube, we'll tell you how much the bottle costs. Now, the data looks like this, right? So the x-axis here is time, the y-axis is activation. Positive numbers mean you like it, negative numbers mean you don't. So subject, here comes the $10 bottle of wine. I'm anticipating it's going to be good, it hits my tongue. Eh, it's not so good, I don't like that wine. Now subject, here comes the $90 bottle of wine. Same anticipation, it's going to taste good. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful, the nutty tannins. But you know the trick, right? It's the same wine. But this is not social proof. This isn't where you drink something and everybody else says it tastes good and you thought it was awful, so you say it tastes good too. Nobody in this experiment ever said whether they liked or didn't like what they tasted. The researchers just read their brains. And their brains said that they physically experienced something different when they thought they were consuming more. Now, if you believe that, right, we are not going to conserve our way to 10 billion people with four times more GDP per head in four short decades. We have to do something different, which is to consume better. Delivering the experience of more, scratching an evolutionary itch that is not gonna go away, but doing it with the resource impact of less. Let me stress that I am not talking about efficiency. Efficiency is about delivering a bare minimum experience and hoping that I don't notice the trade-offs. Efficiency is about really crappy toilet paper, and about lighting controls that dim the room while I'm still at my desk, and about shower heads that fail to cleanse my filthy body. I'm talking here about more energy, more lighting, more transportation, more experiences, more consumption, but in a sustainable way. And there's one way to do that, it is through radical technology innovation. Why is that? Ultimately, the argument is power density. The journey of humanity is a journey to ever greater power density. First we burned wood, then we burned coal, then we split atoms. The power density per unit of volume from one of those to the last is six orders of magnitude. The renewable energy technologies we have today, whether it is today's solar cells, today's wind, are wonderful. They're the best things we've got. We should put all our effort into deploying more of them. But they are incredibly insufficient for scaling the world to 10 billion people. And the numbers make it pretty obvious. The aerial power density of a coal plant, watts per square meter, is about 400. For a nuclear facility, nuclear fission, about 800. For a concentrating solar facility, the big kind they build in the desert, about 40. An order of magnitude in the opposite direction of history. Now the good news is, we do have technologies that we can draw on which bring us back in the line of human history. Some of those look more like conventional renewables. We're not going to exceed 30% conversion efficiency from any photochemical cell in a single junction, but we can get up to 90% efficient with solar antennae like these, which are the next frontier of solar technology. We have a lot of downsides with existing nuclear technology like this tokamak reactor that you see here. You've got to remember all existing nuclear tech was developed in the 1930s and 40s based on weapons research, where things like having radioactivity and fallout were considered features, not bugs. But bear in mind, we have an entire other generation of nuclear science that has not been drawn on to date. It's being developed at places like MIT just across the river in smaller, more modular reactors that are aneutronic with no fissile material on the front end, no radioactivity on the back. Those are the reasons that I am confident we can solve the problem of people times stuff per person times resources per unit of stuff. I think we can consume better 
and we can do it through radical technology innovation. That's all I got. Thanks for your time. Thank you.